Welcome back. Um, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 24. We're approaching the end of the book. We're actually going to cover a lot of ground in this class, and we're going to cover it quickly. Um, I know the last class was maybe a little bit long, and there was a, a holdover from the last class I wanted to mention. <clears throat> Back in uh, 1 Samuel 23, verse 28, uh, remember Saul had David surrounded and, um, and there was a Philistine invasion and they called him away and you know, David was saved just in the nick of time. They named that place, remember, they named that place uh, Selah Hamakaloth, Hamalakoth, Selah Hamalakoth. And um, if I, I did look it up, it means the cliff of escapes, the cliff of escapes, Selah Hamalakoth. Anyway, so uh, in case you were curious about that, um, it is, they just transliterated the actual word and did not give us the interpretation of the name uh, here in the Bible, um, but that's what it means, the cliff of escapes. Um, so David leaves uh, that mountain and moves uh, himself and his men to En Gedi, um, and so we'll take a look there, we'll pick up in verse 1 of chapter 24. And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. People just keep turning him in. Uh, and then Saul told 3,000 chosen men, or took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. So David is literally out in the middle of nowhere. Um, Saul picks up where he leaves off after he's done with this skirmish with the Philistines and uh, it takes 3,000 men goes after David. Verse 3, And he came to the sheep coats by the way where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. So David shored up in one of the caves here in this rocky, mountainous wilderness, and Saul um, goes into one of the caves, and uh, it just happens to be the one David's in. <laughs> um, uh, there, is, uh, 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 there is this occasion, it is rather it is on this occasion, that David... Uh, pens two psalms that are titled with uh, this time as being the, the motivation and the circumstances uh, surrounding their, uh, their being written. Psalm 57 is the first one. Uh, psalm 57, let me get there. Uh, again, it's written to the chief musician. Uh, again, at this time would have been Asaph. Uh, and then Altasheth appears again in the uh, in the introductory notes. Um, and we talked about that. Do not you know? Do not destroy or do not. Uh, but some people think it might have been the tune. I, I, I think more likely it was uh, a requirement for the chief musician to use this song forever in perpetuity. And I I, I, I sort of believe that that's what that is in reference to. Um, it's a mictum of David or one of his golden psalms, possibly engraved for posterity. It's of significant importance. Only six psalms claim this distinction. Psalm 16 and Psalm 56 through 60 uh, all call themselves golden psalms. And, um, and so I, that, I, in my mind, back of that Altashith really means more to use this in perpetuity. Uh, and again, it was written for this special occasion. Uh, this is just a beautiful psalm. It is just absolutely gorgeous, and this really shows uh, David's talent as a musician uh, here. And let's take a look at this, um, as David expresses his trust in God. Psalm 57, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge, until these calamities be overpassed. He believed God was going to get him through this. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. So what does he do when he's in trouble? He praises God. He glorifies God. When he's in distress, be exalted, O God. His first reaction is to praise the Lord. We could take a lesson from that by itself. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. Selah. We're going to find out what he means by that. 
This is the place where, where Saul kind of comes up on, uh, where David kind of comes up on Saul while he's sleeping and cuts the skirt off of his garment. For those of us that know the story, uh, they dig a pit for themselves. They, they, God, has, God has given him into my hands. Well, David's going to correct his own thinking here. And I think the difference between Saul not realizing God had not delivered David into his own hands in Keilah and the difference between that and David realizing God had not delivered Saul in his hands was that David's perspective was about God. Saul's was about himself. Saul was all about himself. David's perspective is God. Um, uh, verse 7, my heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, sultry and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. So beautiful. Just so, so beautiful. Uh, David um, wrote this psalm. He also wrote Psalm 142. So we'll just take a look at that really quickly. I don't intend to spend a lot of time on it. It's kind of a shorter psalm. But Psalm 142 is also titled um, a teaching psalm. Um, it was, uh, again, a psalm of David. And it says a prayer when he was in the cave. Um, so he's just going to cry to God in his great grief. Now, th th there's some significant things, though, that I want to point out about David's perspective here. I cried unto the Lord, verse 1, Psalm 142, 1. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, have they privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no one that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. And it really feels like that. In David's life, he, he, he got out of Keilah. They, turned him, they were going to turn him in. And he got out of, uh, out of, out of uh, Mo, uh, Mo, uh, Moan, and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, Moan, uh, where they were going to turn, Ziph was going to turn him in. And he runs to En Gedi, and Saul's pursuing him in En Gedi. No man cared for my soul. And you can feel the distress of his heart here. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Saul's 3,000 men. David's got 600 at his best. 600. Saul's 3,000. I don't know what the math is. What? That's like five times as many people. Five to one odds. Not very good odds. They're stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. David was God-focused. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. I think it's interesting. No answer is given. David doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't really know how this is going to play out. But he ends the psalm in a beautiful expression of faith. God, you're going to take care of this. And when you do, I will praise you. It's beautiful. Absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Back in 1 Samuel, then, uh, 1 Samuel 24, we'll pick up our reading in verse 3. 1 Samuel 24, verse 3. Uh, and he came to the sheep coats by the way where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest to do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. The Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. So what's the difference in perspective here? David initially had the same um, uh, belief or same impression, God has delivered my enemy into my hand. And then he's like, no, wait a minute. What changed his mind? I think it was his focus on God. It was his God-centeredness and, and having God be the central part of his thinking, leaving the vengeance to God. This is up to God. 
I'm, he didn't kill Saul. I don't think he ever intended to kill Saul. But he did tell him, he did want to let him know that he could have. And this comes up. Uh, this comes up. Let, let's take a look at verse 8. Uh, David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My lord the king. A term of respect. He respects him. My lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou man's word, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, but mine eye spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see ye, the, the, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and I have not sinned against thee. Yet thou huntest my soul to take it. With great respect, he defends himself and says, listen, they encouraged me. They wanted me to kill you. And I chose not to because you're God's anointed. We see Saul's uh, uh, reaction to this, and really, it's precious. Uh, I've said before, I really do think Saul loved David. He just couldn't get over himself. He, he, he struggled with the demons of, 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 of the consequences of his own actions. And when God departed from Saul once and for all, Saul just had no self-control, even over people he cared about. He, he threw a javelin in his own son. This is the kind of guy we're talking about. So um, look at verse 16, uh, chapter 24, verse 16. It came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy son? Is this, my, is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. I think Saul realized what his own sin had brought him to. He kind of came to himself, as it were. And, they, and he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. And thou hast showed this day how the, thou hast dwelt uh, well with me, dealt well with me. For as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, thou killest me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore the Lord reward thee good for that thou hast done unto me this day. And now behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swear unto Saul. This is so... I, what humility! And David swore unto Saul, and Saul went home. But David and his men gat them up unto the hold. This is such an amazing story. What great grace. Saul says, I know you're king next. Then why are you trying to kill him? Right? But Saul says, I know you're going to be king left. I actually want to ask something of you. Okay. Picture yourself in this situation. Are you really in a position to be asking requests? But I think Saul did love David. And I think Saul knew David loved him. And that gave Saul the liberty to ask something he really had no right asking. You see, at this time period of history, and in this culture, if a new dynasty were to take over, all of the royal household from the previous dynasty would be executed just because they were family of the previous dynasty and thereby eliminating any possible claimant of that family to the throne. Saul saying, I beg of you, do not cut off all the seed of my father's house. And David swear it. He promised. David fulfills his promise, by the way. We'll look at that later. David does fulfill his promise. Uh, but, but, but there's a, like, they have this odd, tender moment between father-in-law and son-in-law. David, my son. He said, is this the voice of David, my son? Wow. Unbelievable. David agrees and he swears to him. And then David, in, verse, in chapter 25, uh, uh, we see David's household expanding. I don't really want to take a lot of time on this, except to say that David really started to get the mindset that he was in charge, that he was taking over rulership already. 
Um, he knew he wasn't king of Israel, um, and everybody around him seemed to be turning him in. But he begins to um, act in a act kingly. I mean, after all, he's been protecting people. He's been uh, doing uh, things that are positive uh, for the country already. Uh, he'll do more. We'll see that as we go along. Um, and so we have this odd story of how he gets his second wife, Abigail. Um, his first wife was the daughter of Saul, Michael, right? Uh, and then this is Abigail. Nabal, uh, Abigail's first husband, was a wealthy, a wealthy man of Maon. And remember, they were the, the Ziphites at Maon. They were going to turn him in. This is this is this man. Nabal he was an evil man. Abigail was a wise and a beautiful woman. And David offers an agreement of peace with Nabal. Uh, Nabal not only refuses to accept peace with David, he actually really hurls some pretty bad insults. And we're not even going to take the time uh, in this class to go over it because there's so much more I want to cover. But David takes 400 of his 600 men and has to deal with this insult. Um, Abigail find, finds out about her husband's foolishness, finds out, um, I, I guess she kind of guesses what David is going to do about it, and really um, takes a gift without the knowledge of her husband and pleads for the life of her family. There's some really great women in the Bible. And evidently David was taken with her. Um, Abigail told Nabal all that, I'm uh, sorry, David decided, to, he accepted the gift, decided not to kill Nabal and his family. Um, but Abigail told Nabal all that she had done, and he had a stroke <laughs> and died 10 days later. Um, so God really intervenes here. Uh, when David heard that Nabal was dead, he praised God for acting on his behalf and sent Abigail with a, Abigail with a marriage proposal, and she accepts. Now remember, David's not sitting on the throne at this time. David is still running from his enemies, although he's made some peace with Saul. But people are still turning him in. He marries this girl. And we find out um, uh, uh, at verse 43, and we can just turn there, chapter 25, verse 43, David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they were also both of them his wives. But Saul had given Michael his daughter, David's wife, to Falti, the son of Laish, which was at Galim. So, I love you. Don't cut, don't cut off my, my, my family's name. And, and, you know, just when you come into I know you're going to be king. It's, oh, it's really hard to take Saul at his word because now he takes his daughter and gives her to another man. David's not dead. Um, I'm just wondering if David's lifestyle made Saul think, well, he's not worthy of the princess. I don't, I don't really know what. Uh, we're not really told a lot of information. David's going to go get her back. It was just really, really hysterical story. Um, but uh, but but uh, we're not there yet. It's, it's it's a riot. David goes after his own. Um, but but uh, Abigail accepts his proposal. He marries Ahinoam of Jezreel. Um, so he, he gets two more wives. And Saul, Michael's daughter, is given to Falti of Galim. We see in chapter 26 then that David uh, returns to the wilderness of Ziph. The Ziphites came to Saul and Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hakalah, which is before Jeshimon? So they turn him in again. These people obviously are not friends of David. I'm not sure why he went back there again, but he ended up going back. David takes 3,000 men, once, or Saul rather, takes 3,000 men and goes after, uh, after David once again. Oh, I know you're going to be king. Don't cut off my... Oh, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. This guy is so imbalanced, you can just hardly handle it. Verse 3 says, um, And Saul pitched in the hill of Hakalah, which is before Jeshimon, by the way. But David abode in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was come in very deed. Uh, verse, uh, verse 5, And David arose, came to the place where Saul had pitched, and David beheld the place where Saul lay, and Abner the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. Then answered David, and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai the son of Zeriah, brother to Joab, and these people are going to really play into David's administration later on, and we'll, we'll get into that, but this is, this is kind of the, the biblical introduction to a lot of these people. Um, to, uh, 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 who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So, uh, so David is there, uh, they're, they're, they're hidden, and now they're going to sneak into the camp, um, and they're going to oh, they're going to do a little mischief. David has decided he's not going to kill Saul, he won't touch the Lord's anointed, but he is going to prove that he could have and he's going to prove his loyalty. David is determined to prove to Saul that I love you. I am loyal to you. I do not intend you harm. Leave me alone. 
Um, so look at look at verse, uh, let me see, where were we at? We were at verse uh, 7. Let's read there. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and Saul, uh, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster, but Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. <laughs> I'll get him the first time. Um, he's really passionate about this. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, and he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water, and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they gat them away, and no man saw it nor knew it, neither awaked, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. So, so they sneak into camp. Abishai's like, let me kill him. If you don't want to do it, I'll do it, and I'll do it in one stroke. I won't even need a second time. And David said, no, this is the Lord's anointed. We're not going to kill him, but... We're going to let them know we were here. So they took Saul's spear, and they took his water bottle. Now, this is kind of funny um, because I think David and Abner kind of have a love-hate relationship for the rest of their life, um, uh, for the rest of their existence together uh, because we see he's going to give David some problems even after he becomes king. But um, So David and Abner kind of have this uh, this falling out, look at verse 13, this kind of kills me. Then David went over to the other side, stood on the top of a hill afar off, and a great space being between them. And David cried to the people, and to Abner the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? And David said to Abner, Art thou not a valiant man, and who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore, that, uh, wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is, and the cruise of water that was at his bolster. And Saul knew David's voice and said, now this is, this, uh, Saul once again comes to himself. He, he is made to realize that David is not really the enemy here. And uh, this, is, this just almost gets tender. Um, and I uh, believe this is the last pursuit of Saul against David as well. Um, but, but let's take a look at, at, at Saul's uh, answer back. When he knows that this is, uh, this is David, verse 17, Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son, David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in mine hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. Remember that, that the land itself in Israel was an inheritance of God. And David is literally saying, you have made me to lose what God gave me. And this is on you. Uh, verse, uh, uh, verse 20, Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Finally, some humility from Saul. And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. And the Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand this day, but I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let, that, so let my life be much set by in the, in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. This isn't about you, Saul. You are not delivering me from yourself. The Lord is delivering me out of all my tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things, and also shalt still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul 
return to his place. Wow. So, so we see that, 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 that Saul returns away from, uh, uh, from following David. I, I, I believe this is the last time Saul pursues David. He's true to his word at this point, whether because he does get into some problems with the Philistines um, or, or whether it is him finally, finally coming to realization David is not an enemy. Um, he does stop pursuing David as an enemy. And this gives David a chance to um, head back to Judah. Um, and, and some interesting things happen. Remember Achish? Get out. Why are you bringing me mad people? Um, I think he's going to come back into David's life again. I told you, Gath remains an important city in David's life pretty much through the rest of his life. Uh, so we're in chapter 27, verse 1. We'll read verses 1 through 7. And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. <laughs> and there's just no hope. This guy's just going to keep coming after me. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. I don't know why he keeps going there. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more at any coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. And David arose, and he passed over with the 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Moak, king of Gath. And David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahanoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's wife. And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. So he's done. And David said unto Achish, If I, I have now found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. At the time Samuel was written, the book of 1 Samuel was written, Ziklag still belonged to the royal line. Verse 7, and the, and the time when David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a year, a full year, and four months. So um, Achish, he goes back to, to Achish for whatever reason. This is why I think that maybe there was more to the story than were actually told in the biblical account um, because uh, while he did kind of toss him out on his ear there when he acted like a mad person, uh, he ended up giving him a city. So he couldn't have hated him too awful much. Uh, verse 8 then. Uh, kind of gives a little bit more of uh, the relationship between David and Achish. Um, Achish is kind of self-serving, and so we'll see that in, uh, in, in some of why he does and the motivation for some of the things that he does. Look at verse 8. Um, and David and his men went up and invaded the, uh, the Jeshurites and the Gerizites and the Amalekites, for those nations were of old the inhabitants of the land, as thou goest to Shur, even to the land of Egypt. And David smote the land and left neither man nor woman alive and took away the sheep and the oxen and the asses and the camels and the apparel and returned and came to Achish. So David goes and he does what, what Israel was supposed to do back in the time of Joshua. And he destroys the inhabitants of the lands. And he goes back to Achish and now he's kind of I don't know. David's kind of political. He, he, um, you know, he, he went to Ahimelech and he said this uh, to get what he needed. And he goes to Achish and he's kind of going to do this again. He's going to put a spin on it um, as a, really as a way to um, uh, preserve. It was this preservation that he's doing here. Verse 10, uh, And Achish said, Whither have you made a road today? And David said, Against the south of Judah, and against the south of the Jeremielites, and against the south of the Kenites. And David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring tidings to Gath, saying, Lest they should tell on us. Um, saying, So did David, and so will, will be his manner, all the while he dwelleth in the country of the Philistines. And Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel utterly to abhor him, therefore he shall be my servant forever. So David goes and does these things, but he doesn't leave any of them alive to go back and tell Gath, you know, David intends to clean you out also. Um, and, and so he kind of tells Achish his version of what happened, uh, giving Achish the impression that David will do battle for him uh, against his enemies. And uh, surely he'll be my servant forever is Achish's um, idea. He puts his twist on his intentions and lead Achish to believe this is for Gath as Israel has rejected him. Israel hasn't entirely rejected him. Um, we move into chapter 28 uh, and verse 1. And it came to pass in those days the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. 
made him his personal bodyguard. And Samuel, now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together, and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. Now, um, the, the writer of Samuel is kind of setting up the story for some events that are coming. Um, and we're not going to read through every little detail uh, of this for the sake of time, uh, but basically uh, David's loyalties are called into question. Achish commands David to take part in the next Philistine invasion of Israel, actually. Um, so, uh, you know, he, I think he's really testing to see how far David's loyalties will go. Uh, David agrees, and he appoints he and his men as his own personal bodyguards. Now, what we're not going to read through, because this really tends more towards Saul's issues than David's, but it is here in the text. Um, David, uh, rather Saul, dabbles in some witchcraft, and that's why back in verse 3 it says Saul had commanded everybody that had evil spirits, uh, you know, put them, sent them away or put them to death. I don't remember exactly which it said. Um, but uh, Saul dabbles in, in, in witchcraft. Um, Saul saw his enemy upon him, tried to talk to God, and God does not talk back to him. He doesn't know what to do. It says Samuel had died. That's who Saul would have called. So Saul's got nobody left. Saul doesn't know how to get the word of God. Doesn't know how to find out what's going to happen. Um, so Saul disguises himself and goes to Endor to a witch there. Um, and, and she ends up finding out uh, that this is King Saul. Um, she calls up Samuel. The question is often asked, did she really call up the spirit of Samuel? The Bible says the spirit of Samuel. Um, so I do believe that God allowed this instance to occur. Um, but uh, she called up Samuel. Saul bows himself to the ground, wanted to know if he'd win in battle or not. And uh, Samuel delivers a doubly negative message. Um, because he did not utterly destroy Amalek back when he was first king, uh, God has taken the kingdom from Saul and given it to David, which he's already expressed that he knows. And then um, the Israel, uh, Israel will fall to the Philistines, and tomorrow he and his sons are going to die. Then they ate, and they leave the witch's house. Now, um, so he gets some seriously bad news, and uh, it's interesting that he just eats and moves on. Uh, this is how calloused he has become to this news. It's almost like, okay, whatever. He's kind of accepted his fate. God isn't talking to me. Samuel's dead. The Philistines are going to invade and I'm going to die. Okay, where's the food? Um, this is, these are marks of a very depressed uh, individual and a suppressed individual. Um, but here in verse 5 of chapter 29, uh, we read, um, uh, excuse me, we read, uh, uh, yes, First Samuel 29 and verse 5. Wait a minute, I feel like I skipped something. Uh, nope, in verse 5 of 29 we read, um, the Achish makes David leave the battle before it begins. Um, the Philistine lords don't trust David. And he actually forces David to go. And I believe this is God working behind the scenes. Um, I'll just read this really quick. It's not this David of whom they sang to one, of the, uh, to one another in dances, saying, Saul slew his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Then Achish called David and said unto him, Surely as the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out and thy coming in with me, and the host is good in my sight, for I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the Lord's favor thee not. Wherefore now return, go in peace, that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servant so long as I have been with thee unto this day, that I may not go fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight as an angel of God. Notwithstanding, the princes of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Wherefore now rise up early in the morning with thy master's servants that are come with thee, and as soon as ye be up early in the morning and have light, depart. So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So we see that God works out the circumstances in David's life to where David is actually dismissed from the service of Achish. Um, so he gets Ziklag, and he does serve the Philistines for a, a short time. And, um, and, and Achish thinks he's got something great. But God stirs up the nest, and he has to release David from his service. And again, that's God working behind the scenes. David's going to be king of Israel. He can't be fighting in the Philistine army. 
best king of Israel. It's not going to work out. Um, so, so God makes that happen. Um, so he returns to Ziklag, the possession given to him by Achish here in chapter 30 uh, and verse 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag uh, and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire, had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Awful. I can't even imagine what, what, what must be going through the heart of these people when they come and find out that their city is burnt and their families are all missing. David consults with God what to do. The men talk of stoning David. Their grief is so great. And this is something about grief that, that you can learn. People say things, think things, do things that are not natural to them. And really they don't mean whenever they find themselves in, in a position of overwhelming grief. And uh, they certainly find that uh, themselves in this position here. So David goes to God. Again, first thing David does, he goes to God. Ask, what am I going to do? Uh, he went to God and asked if he ought to pursue the enemy. And God said, pursue, and he assures him of his success. So David pursues against the Amalekites. And he says, okay, which, which of my men are, will go with me? 200 were just too faint with grief to pursue. They just were so distraught, they could not focus on battle. So David takes 400 men to recover their, uh, their families and their possessions. Well, David finds an Egyptian, and we're going to read this in verse 11, chapter 30, verse 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field, brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days or three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an, uh, and to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. We had an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites, and upon the coast which belongs to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said unto him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into thy hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. So, uh, so this man, this Egyptian, helps David find uh, his enemies there, where the families are at. And David attacks back in verses 17 through 20. They attack the party. They kill them all, except 400 men that had escaped on Camelback. They recovered all their families, as God had promised. They recovered all their goods. And it seems more than that, uh, more than what they had lost uh, through, uh, through the, the, the attack on Ziklag. So then they returned to the brook Bezor, and the 400 men who had pursued against the, uh, the uh, Amalekites didn't want to share spoils with the 200 that stayed. And David disagreed. I, I want to take a look at this. Uh, verse 23, um, and then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath uh, pres uh, preserved us, delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. So David's wisdom eventually passes into Israelite law. Those that stay by base camp and protect it get the same booty as those that run off and go into battle. So David returns to Ziklag with the spoil God gave them uh, from their enemies, and they divide it among all Judah. So we move into the last chapter of, and I know I'm moving quickly because I want to, <coughs> excuse me, I want to get into uh, a, a couple of these big stories. We see the battle of Mount Gilboa and then finally the death of Saul. And this is relevant um, to David's life. Not only is his successor going to pass away, he loses his son Jonathan as is promised, um, uh, or rather uh, uh, Saul's son Jonathan uh, as is promised, and um, David, uh, well, we'll get to it in a second. He get, becomes, uh, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. I don't want to jump ahead of myself. Uh, but he writes an ode, uh, a, a, a lament. Uh, lamentation, as it were. We're going to talk about that because it's a little, it's, it's, it's very significant. And it ties into some other parts of the Bible, which we'll look at here in just a moment. But in chapter 31, 
um, David is in Hebron and the Philistines attack Israel. And it seems that they're specifically attempting to rout the royal line. Verse 2, Philistines followed hard upon Saul and his sons. They slew Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua, Saul's sons. So it, it seems like they're really just going after Saul. Now, whether Achish was trying to do David a favor or they just were after uh, after the, the, the leader so that they could try to begin taking over Israel piece by piece. It's unclear, but at any rate, they go after Saul, they go after his sons on purpose, and they kill them. Uh, David's wisdom, I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, so they killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua, uh, Saul's sons on the battlefield. Saul's hit by archers. Uh, and he asked his armor bearer to kill him so he wouldn't have the opportunity to be tortured to death. Uh, he knew that if the Philistines had captured him and he was still alive, that they would just have their way with him and it would just be an awful, awful experience for him. So he asks his armor bearer in verse 4 to take his life, but his armor bearer would not. And so Saul commits suicide by falling on his own sword. Uh, when his armor bearer saw that in verse 5, uh, when his armor bearer saw, saw, was, saw Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his own sword and died with them. So he also committed suicide uh, after he saw Saul commit suicide. The Israelite army retreats. They flee to the cities on the east bank of the Jordan, and the Philistine occupied the cities there. Um, the Philistines uh, came to spoil the possessions and the weapons of the dead, and they find Saul and his son's bodies. They cut off Saul's head. Um, they hang it on the wall of Bethshan. They strip off their armor and they put it in the house of Ashtaroth, which was a, a false god, uh, a false god of the Philistines. And they hung the bodies of Saul's sons on the same wall with him. So it's kind of a bragging um, effect. It really, it's, a, it's a terror, really. It, it is a, a, a trying to manipulate terror in the heart of the enemy. We have your leader, here's his body, uh, and they display it for them. In horrific response. Starting in verse 11, Israel responds, and when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. And that's how the book of 1 Samuel closes. Uh, so that the, the, the valiant men, the brave men, went and got the bodies and gave him uh, a burial. Um, they burnt his body. I, I don't really know about the, the reasons for that, except that perhaps they were afraid of some kind of disease, maybe. Um, but they gave his bones a proper burial uh, there in Jabesh. So we move into the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 1. And we see that the crown is now going to pass to David. But we get this idea that David, king of Israel, and yeah, he will. He will divide, he will rather unify the nation, but he doesn't start out quite that popular. <laughs> and he, his path to the throne is, is not really um, so easy. Uh, it's progressive. And we see the rumblings of this progression as we end this uh, this first segment of the path to the throne where we divided his life into four segments. Um, we talked about uh, the, the path of the throne, king of Judah, king of Israel, and then uh, a couple of his notable works. Um, uh, uh, we end this segment with the crown passing to David in first Sam Second Samuel 1, 1 through 16. A man comes to David with the rigors of battle evident on his person. Um, and he has just come from the battle of Mount Gilboa, found that Saul... Uh, Saul's suicide attempt had been unsuccessful. So this armor bearer dies in vain, and Saul asks the man, an Amalekite, to kill him. Um, and so the Amalekite does, uh, verses, uh, verse 8 through 10. Um, so I stood on him. This is his own testimony, the Amalekite's own testimony. I stood on him and slew him because I was sure he could not live after that he was fallen. I took the crown from his head, the bracelet on his arm, and I brought them hither unto my Lord. He was looking for favor. He's looking to, he thought he did, had done a good thing. Um, then David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with them. They followed David's example. I can only imagine that if David had bitterness against Saul, that these men would not have had the same attitude. David sorrows grievously over the death of his father-in-law, king of Israel, the Lord's anointed. Uh, the Amalekite takes these uh, items, these symbols of royalty from the body of Saul, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and they fast. Uh, he brings it to the men. David and his men find out. They tear their clothes. They fast the rest of this day. 
but that's not the end of the story. Verse 13, David decides to do something about this. David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he said, I am a son of a stranger and a Malachite. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand and destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men, and he said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Now, um, and, and that's, that's how David comes to the throne of Judah, um, which we will start in the next class, and we'll talk about him uh, reigning from Judah's throne um, before he gets kingship of all Israel. He, he doesn't get to be king of Israel yet. He's only king of Judah, which is kind of where he's from. Um, but we'll talk about that next time. But the remainder of chapter 1 is a beautiful lamentation. It's an ode of lament written by David on the occasion of the death of Saul and Jonathan. Um, I'm going to read the entire ode, and then I want to comment on, on the book of Jasher that, it is, that it's mentioned here. And I want to tie some things in about the book of Jasher. It really is kind of unrelated, so it's kind of nice to have this hiccup between the path to kingship and king of Judah. Um, so it'll kind of give us a little bit of, of an interlude there um, without just crossing into uh, one subject from another. Um, but, but we see here in verse uh, 17, David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. Also, he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. We'll discuss that in just a second. Here's the ode. The beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ascalon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away, the shield of Saul, as though he had been not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? I want to say two things. One, um, verse 26, uh, that he says the love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. This is not a sexual reference, by the way. David and Jonathan did not have a homosexual relationship as has been accused. He was just describing how deep and intense his love for Jonathan was, how dear he was to him. Um, and that was certainly evidence, even though they were divided most of their life, uh, uh, geographically, their hearts remained knit together uh, in, 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 uh, in, in within themselves emotionally. But the second is this book of Jasher, and this is a really great way to kind of uh, move along uh, and, and put a separation from the path to kingship and king of Judah. Um, the book of Jasher, we go back up to verse uh, 18, and it says, He also bade them teach the children of Israel the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. Now, the use of the bow, that is not um, archery, I don't believe. I don't believe that's archery. Um, the bow, I believe, was the title of, of this lamentation that was patterned after a, the lamentation that was written in the book of Jasher. Um, evidence. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the evidence for this. Um, if we look back in Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 10. And verse 13, Joshua chapter 10 and verse 13, And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heavens, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. So the book of Jasher. The word Jasher actually means upright. So we're really talking about the book of the upright. Uh, it's mentioned here in 2 Samuel 1, 18. It's mentioned in Joshua 10, 13. 
Um, and, and now there's a reference to, uh, there's a tie-in rather, in Habakkuk uh, chapter 3. And we're going to look at that next year in a second. But these two expressly mention the book of the upright, the book of Jasher. And um, when we look at uh, Joshua 10, 13, and we see uh, how it's being used here, again, in a warfare context, um, uh, uh, verse 13, the sun stood still. Uh, if we go back to verse 12, Joshua spake, uh, I'm sorry, then spake Joshua the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel and said in the sight of Israel's son, Stand thou still upon Gibeon, thou moon in the valley of Ajalon, um, and there's no day like it before it or after it. The Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Um, and, and, and so we see this is a, a, a battle uh, a, a sequence here in the 10th chapter of Joshua. And we see that the book of Jasher is referenced in the book of the upright. Um, and, and again, uh, we see that, that it is tied in by the title to the lamentation that David writes in the, uh, about Saul. What is this lamentation? Well, there is uh, a book of Jasher floating around the internet uh, for what it's worth. But actually, there's between 8 and 12 books that claim to be this book of Jasher. Uh, are any of them the book of Jasher? I, I'm going to say probably not. Um, I, I am not a Hebrew scholar, so I don't take my word for it. But let's take a, take a look at how Habakkuk fits into this, because I really think this is going to open up some key points in determining what this book of Jasher is. So turn to Habakkuk. Chapter 3, I should have marked it in my Bible because it's one of those itty-bitty books. Uh, let me see here. Hosea, Job, Abus, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. There we go, chapter 3. And if you look, Habakkuk is unique throughout the Old Testament in that, in this chapter, a lot of elements are similar to many of the Psalms. The word Selah is used periodically. It has a title. Um, it has, um, let me see, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shigianoth. And Shigianoth was a type of ecstatic lamentation. It was a crying out to God. Joshua was crying out to God and commanded the sun and the moon to stand still, and it did. Just like he had read about in the book of the upright, in the book of Jasher. David takes the, the, the book of Jasher and one of the songs from the, one of the lamentations of the book of Jasher, the bow, and he writes it out in a lamentation upon the occasion of the death of Saul. How, how do we know Habakkuk 3 falls in? Remember he said, I command the sun to stand still and the moon not to move. Look at uh, Habakkuk chapter 3, uh, verse 2. O Lord, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. So this is still a lamentation and a crying out to God for assistance uh, in this time uh, of, of tragedy. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and his earth was full of praise and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld held and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. And he goes on, he just keeps, um, he keeps describing God and how, uh, and how God worked wondrously in spite of the difficult circumstances. Uh, if we look down at, um, at verse uh, 16, Verse 15, Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the, heap, through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the field, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Time of tragedy, time of difficulty. What does he do? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. And then he finishes up to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. That word on my stringed instruments is neganoth which is the exact same instructions given in the book of Psalms when they are commanded to sing the psalms with the stringed instruments. 
So I believe this all ties in together. This book of Jasher was a lamentation or a book of lamentations of the upright and how they cried out unto God. And we see an example of that in Joshua. And we see an example of that in 2 Samuel. And we see a, a, an example of that here in Habakkuk 3. In fact, in verse 11, it says, The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. So, again, I believe a reference to this book of Jasher. Uh, a, 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 almost as if it were a required study guide for, for how to praise the Lord in, in, in the worship of God. Joshua references it, David references it, and now Habakkuk also quotes similar statements as though it came from that as well, and it would make sense if he's a musician. And it seems to be the case since he uses a lot of terms that are similar, Selah and Neganoth and, and Shagion, uh, how do you say that exactly, uh, Shigionoth, uh, and, and a lot of these other musical terms all ties in together, this book of the upright. So if we look back in 2 Samuel again, verse 1, just to wrap up really quickly, I'm in mean Kings, Samuel's before Kings. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 1, and he, uh, verse, uh, verse 18, He bade them also teach the children of Israel the use of the bow. We're going to take this lamentation from the book of the upright. We're going to teach it to Judah. Oh, how the mighty are fallen. Yea, the daughters of Israel weep over Saul. The blood of the slain, the fat of the mighty, um, the bow of Jonathan returned not empty. Saul's sword was successful. But oh, how the mighty are, are fallen. Ye mountains of Gabal, let there be no dew, dew, nor the rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. The shield of the, of the mighty is vilely cast away. This horrible, horrible situation. Um, I, I do think it's interesting that in this particular lamentation, there is not necessarily a crying unto God. And I do think that that is interesting, although if you continue to chapter 2, the Bible says David immediately goes and inquires of the Lord. And so um, while the lamentation itself is not a crying out unto God, although we do see in Habakkuk it is, we see in Joshua it is, here in David he was just so grieved at the loss of Saul and Jonathan that he just had to express his emotions. I want to say something here, and I feel impressed to say it's okay to cry out to God in times of grief. It's okay to tell God how you feel as long as you don't walk in bitterness and as long as you don't arrogantly question the motives of God, it's okay to even ask God why. It's okay. We see David, oh, how the mighty are fallen. And, uh, and, and, and from this, David will rise to the position of king of all Israel, but it's going to take some time. David still has some battles and some struggles and some trials and some tribulations to go through. And we see that happen in his life as he's on his path to kingship. And so we're going to end this section right here at 2 Samuel chapter 1. We'll pick up as he's crowned king of Judah in 2 Samuel chapter 2 next time.